Hello and welcome to The Daily Climate Show, where we track the changes to our world and investigate some of the potential solutions to the climate crisis. Now, extreme downpours could become four times more frequent in 50 years' time if greenhouse gas emissions remain high. That's according to a new study from the Met Office, which found that for every degree of warming, the intensity of extreme downpours could also increase by up to 15%. In England alone, an estimated 3 million properties are at risk from surface water flooding. Well, let's speak now to the lead author of that report, Professor Lizzie Kendon, who is a climate scientist at the Met Office. Lizzie, thank you so much for talking to us. So what did you find? So we, 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 here we're running some very high-resolution climate simulations. So we're using the, the model that we typically use for operational weather forecasting here at the Met Office, but we're now using it to look at how climate might emerge over the coming years and decades right out to the end of the century under a high emission scenario. And what we found is that um, extreme rainfall events, um, the type of events that can lead to flash flooding, um, are going to increase um, four times in by 2080 compared to 1980s if we follow a high emission scenario. So the sort of event I'm talking about here is like the sort of event we had in London um, back in July 2021, when Kew Gardens got um, a month's rainfall in about three hours, and that led to real big disruption. So we had, um, you know, tube, tube stations closed um, and lots of, lots of flooding in London. And then actually a couple of weeks later, we had a very similar event, which led to two hospitals being flooded in London. So these are the sort of events we're talking about here. They can lead to really a major disruption um, and, and if we follow a high emission scenario, we're se seeing really big increases in these sort of events in the future. Mm. Um, and I think it's, a, it's important to say that these, this, these results, this four times increase, is, um, is for a high emission scenario. So the changes aren't inevitable. Um, they're very much conditioned on the future scenario we follow. And if we, if we emit less, then the changes will be less. But I think whatever future scenario we follow with we're expecting big changes in heavy rainfall extremes because you know for every single degree of regional warming we're talking about a five to fifteen percent increase in the intensity of these downpours just briefly if we've had the driest summer we've had for 30 years and the driest february we've had for 30 years it doesn't really seem consistent with your findings though so actually we do expect summers to get drier and these projections are very much consistent with that so there's an overall drying picture in summer because of climate change, but the rainfall will come in the form of much intense downpours when it does happen. So there'll be you know, more of these intense downpours and then drier periods in between. But I think what's really important about these projections that we're issuing now is they allow us to look at an envelope of climate as we move through time year by year. So it's not just a single projection. There are a number of different realizations. And what we can see is that exactly how you know, climate change will materialize on a year-by-year -year basis is far from a, a smooth, steady trend. So we may still get you know, very wet summers, even though the overall drying picture it, it, you know, is, is, is the underlying trend. Um, and actually, um, what these results show us is we can actually get also some quite rapid transitions in our climate. So we may have lots and lots of years with relatively few of these extreme downpours, and then suddenly we can have a a jump in the climate when we appear to have a lot more of these events um, and, you know, and a considerable increase in record-breaking events compared to what we've observed up to that point. Okay. And that's purely just a reflection of the, the interplay between um, natural variability in the climate and the underlying trend um, due to human greenhouse gas emissions. OK, Lizzie, thank you so much for talking to us. Right, well, let's have a look at some of the other stories making the news now. And more than half of Britain and Ireland's native plants have declined since the 1950s because of issues like intensive farming and climate change. Warmer weather means some species, like the bee orchid, have spread north, but the change has forced back increasingly rare mountain plants, like snow pearlwort, which can only be found on the snowy peaks of Ben Lowers in the Scottish Highlands. Britain is one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. More than a dozen major cities in China have seen temperatures hit record seasonal highs. Central cities like Wuhan and Zhengzhou recorded temperatures of 26 degrees Celsius. That's more than 10 degrees higher than normal for early March. The country's weather bureau has warned that China faces another year of extreme weather as a result of global climate change. 
Britain drew on reserve coal power plants for the first time this winter as a cold snap grips the UK. The national grid has placed the plants on standby a number of times, but this is the first time they've been needed to feed electricity to the grid. The coal plants were due to close last September as the UK transitions away from fossil fuels, with the UK's demand for coal at its lowest level since 1757. New research shows plastic entering oceans could nearly triple by 2040 if left unchecked. A new study by the Five Gyres Institute, which is an organisation that campaigns to reduce pollution in the seas, says plastic in the oceans has surged by an unprecedented amount. Well, let's speak now to the ocean campaign leader at the Environmental Investigation Agency, Christina Dixon. There she is. Hello to you, Christina. So how is it Hi. that we have seen a surge of plastics in our oceans when there is seemingly such awareness about the danger of plastics? Well, unfortunately, you know, while awareness has been growing in recent years and we've seen a huge uptick in, in people recognising this is a problem and wanting to do something about it, the reality is that the growth of plastic in the environment, so as this study shows in the oceans, has also grown in tandem with plastic production. So we've seen absolutely no decline in the amount of plastic being produced. In fact, projections show that plastic is going to continue to increase. So if we keep producing plastic, unfortunately, we will keep seeing plastic in the environment. And that's, that's the facts. So are we not doing enough then? Currently, we are not doing enough. At the moment, we have really a patchwork of voluntary commitments from companies that are invariably missed um, and legislation around the world that is fragmented at best. So really what we need to see is a global legally binding instrument that can address the full life cycle of plastics. So something that can deal with the production of plastics through the whole life cycle to the point of disposal or you know cleaning up in the environment. Although we really don't want to focus on cleanups, we want to focus on turning off the problem at source. So the really good news is, and I like, I like having some good news to share with you, that um, governments around the world have agreed to negotiate a plastics treaty. And at the moment, we're sort of partway through the development of that treaty. So by the end of 2024, that treaty should be agreed, hopefully. Is that the UN um, proposed treaty that you're talking about that was signed last year, I think, in Nairobi? Exactly. So last year in Nairobi, governments agreed to the mandate to negotiate a new plastics treaty. So what that basically did was kind of trigger the start of negotiations. So the negotiations are a two year process. So at this point, we're in the phase where governments are really agreeing what's the scope of the treaty going to be? You know, how far upstream should it begin? Should it begin at, for example, you know, ending harmful subsidies that um, promote fossil fuel expansion, for example? Um, or should it start more at the point of plastic production, polymerization? Should it deal with chemicals, that kind of thing? And those are really the details that are being fleshed out through a series of negotiations that are taking place um, this year and next year. And so by the end of 2024, we'll have the treaty text um, and then that will be open for adoption in 2025. Christina, can we ever completely get rid of all the plastics that we have already dumped into our oceans? So I think that um, cleaning up plastic that is already in the environment um, is really complex. And I think this study in particular points to the issue of microplastics. So cleaning microplastics is incredibly difficult. Um, and whilst we can focus on um, remediation in areas where it's particularly problematic, you know, I'm thinking about, for example, in soils, in um, freshwater, in the oceans, um, you know, we can do some cleanup, but I think the really critical element that I would love, you know, um, people to take away is that stopping the problem from entering the environment in the first place is really going to be the most effective intervention. So whilst, you know, there is a role for remediation, um, it's really not the, the sort of golden ticket here. OK, Christina, thank you so much for talking to us. Thanks. Now, before we go, we want your climate questions. Anything that has ever mystified you about the environment or whatever you want to get to the bottom of, scan this QR code and send us your questions, which we will answer in The Climate Show with Tom Heap. And you can watch Tom's show. It's on Saturday and Sunday at 3.30 in the afternoon here on Sky News. Thank you so much for watching. That's all from us today. We'll see you tomorrow.